I'm, I'm going to begin. Let me introduce myself to those who uh, don't know me. Uh, so my name is George Lees and I'm, I'm going to be uh, chairing uh, our seminar today. Um, and first of all, let me begin by welcoming our two speakers who join us from what I'm sure is a sunny Brazil. Um, and I will introduce them before they um, make their presentations. But I'd also like to welcome uh, everyone else who is, is, is joining us today from the UK. And I can also see from uh, other parts of Latin America and maybe even other places in, in Europe. But thank you very much, all of you, for, for joining us. Um, let me begin by saying as well that we shall be recording our seminar this afternoon. Uh, so I, I hope everyone is, 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 is okay with that. If you are uncomfortable with that, then uh, clearly uh, you don't want your questions recorded, uh, then uh, maybe you shouldn't answer, ask a question. But uh, otherwise we are recording this, <coughs> excuse me, and it will then be on the website for people to, to see who are unable to join us today. So this is, uh, this is our last but one seminar uh, week uh, here at Oxford uh, in what we call seventh week. And this week we have decided to engage with our colleagues uh, in Latin America. The Institute has since 2009 um, I've been working very closely with colleagues in Latin America, thanks to our Latin American Research Network on aging, um, which I also direct uh, uh, with the uh, aid of Professor uh, Alejandro Klein, who is also joining us today from Mexico. Um, um, and we're very keen to hear how aging is developing and how aging is being tackled, the different issues in Latin America. Uh, I will return to what's happening next week at the end of the seminar, um, where we will be uh, visiting Africa. So, um, let me begin by just outlining how we are going to um, proceed with the seminar this afternoon. So in a moment, I will introduce the first of our two speakers. Um, each of our speakers is probably going to uh, speak for 15, 20 minutes or so. Um, and then they may have comments or questions to one another after those presentations. And then we'll open up for a more general discussion. May I ask that um, people keep their uh, keep their cameras off and their microphones muted unless um, unless they want to ask a question. Um, I'm just I'm just getting a strange message on my computer. Sorry, <laughs> but um, yeah. So if you could keep your cameras off and your microphone's muted unless you want to ask a question so that we can all focus on our, uh, our speaker. So let's, um, without any further hesitation, let's begin. And I'm very pleased to introduce, first of all, um, uh, a longstanding friend and colleague of the Institute, um, Professor Carla da Silva Santana Castro. Um, who is professor at the University of Sao Paulo in, um, in Brazil. <coughs> uh, Carla is an occupational therapist um, and extremely interested in uh, what is called gero technology. Um, and Carla was a visitor to the Institute about five, uh, no, it's actually eight years ago now. Gosh, time flies. Uh, eight years ago, and we've continued our collaboration as part of our Latin American research network. So Carla is going to talk about the impact of our current COVID-19 crisis uh, on the inclusion of older people in Brazil and the lessons that are being learned 
in Brazil. So Carla, I will hand over to you. Thank you very much. Um, there you go. Thank you, George. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, people in UK, and uh, good morning for Brazil. <laughs> uh, initially, uh, I would like to say thank you, Dr. Alison and uh, Sarah and uh, Alejandro Klein to invite me for participating in this, in this seminar. It's very important for me uh, to speak for colleagues, to colleagues of Oxford Institute of Population Aging and for Larna is very important for me. I'm very grateful uh, for the scientific contribution and joint research and uh, experience promoted by the Institute. It's so valuable for me. My experience visiting the Institute was fantastic and I miss so much Oxford and the Institute. Um, I have to say that the English language skills is not the best part of me. So forgive me my mistakes and thank you for your patience. And uh, um, I, I went to, to ask if you have some questions, it's better is it, uh, we use the chat. And uh, uh, George said to me that uh, Alejandro and Emily can, uh, can help me with translation. So I try to to reply in Portuguese and uh, someone can help me. I have to say thank you. And let's start. Uh, I prepared some slides to, to talk, to use. And uh, I went to share. Um, just uh, some minutes. Well, um, I want to talk about uh, the panorama of pandemic by SARS-CoV-2 in Brazil and uh, try to, to make a, a panorama about the size of the pandemic is proportional to the size of Brazil and some lessons who we should have to learn in this lessons for Brazil, the present and the future. Um, for an overview, the Brazilian's population is 210 million and 147,125. So Brazil is the large country in the South America and the adult population in Brazil is over 30 million in 2018. It means one third population. And our uh, panoramic Demographic, the pyramid demographic is, is very large in transition now. So for the overview, uh, the COVID pandemic represents a challenge for the whole world and particularly for the low and middle income countries, given the fragility of their public policies. The world has dealt with the pandemic crisis by SARS-CoV-2 with implication for all sectors of society, for the whole world, but mainly for the health sector, the labor and financial markets, the demand for transport and social protection, education, leisure, as well as family and social structures. Uh, the national data points to 6,118,708 cases of infected people with 170,115 deaths from SARS-CoV-2 with a high mortality, the mortality rate of 18.1%. In Brazil, people over 60 represent 73.6% of deaths. Those who had at least one comorbidity are almost two thirds of deaths, although under report of cases admit by health authorities and the, the test is not uh, uh, for the whole people. Um, so the inequality is striking that the COVID crisis did not create by countries, EU. we exposed them. So 
um, we have we can see some data about the the deaths and the the huge number is extended from 60 uh, 5t 50t and 6 is very large number and uh, you can see in that graphic is very important in number in the deaths so uh, some important regard, aspect regarding the old population have been disclosed since the beginning of the pandemic in Brazil. Uh, more than 18% of older adults depend exclusively on the National Health Service or SUS for us. This percentage is even high among Afro-Brazilian and the poor. The SUS has suffered severe, severe budget cuts for years and even before the pandemic, but its equipment was already on the verge of collapse due to excess demand. There is an urgent need to reverse policies that have led to the dismantling of the SUS, especially in primary care. And uh, if you look at the size of the pandemic, it's proportional to the size of Brazil. The profile of the COVID-19 pandemic in Brazil differ from that other country, but I think it, in many aspects it is so close. At first, this it's younger. Chronic condition and comorbidities are already present in adults over 40 plus, which place them in the high risk group. You can see in that uh, how it's very, it's very huge, the number after the age of 30. It's much dark as among the poorest of the poor Af Afro-Brazilians. Question of race and ethnicity are imperative, including indigenous people, immigrants, and the nomadic peoples, especially immigrants from the South America. Uh, it's even more age-based in econo as economic choice determined in the exclusion or older people from health service. And uh, it is elitist. The poorest Brazilian are deprived of access to diagnose and treatment wherever they live. And uh, it brings more suffering, given the complete lack of palliative care in the public network. So you can see the Brazilian health condition old age is a uh, cause for rotation. People grow old badly and early in Brazil. Deaths by COVID-19 do not only reflect the age composition of the country, but above all of the fact that there have never been policies for active age and health aging, centered on the promotion of health lifelong learning, citizen participation, and the protection of the most vulnerable. So uh, they expose the big problem we have. Millions of Brazilians have failed to follow the preventive guidelines, not because they not want to, but because they cannot. Social exclusions and the structural, structural discrimination deny them full access to the high, their rights. Constitutional Amendment 95 further reduced the resource from the health promotion to prevention, from the primary care to the hospital services, from sanitation condition to care for the most dependent, all of which have been affected by several cuts to the social policies budget. So publicly, we have some lessons we should have learned. Public policies need to be created with people, not for the people. Uh, we have to, to look after our older adult rights councils have been severely weakened over the past year, uh, especially in the last year because they changed the government. Uh, in particular, the National Council, which has little dialogue with civil society. In the, pres the present moment, confront politics, science, and religions. And this is so hard during the pandemic. Started the last year, but uh, in that moment, it's so hard. It's necessary to learn from the past. Cause, because in the, all the time with no mask, uh, the fake news, and no crisis, and the COVID is just a little flu, it's 
is very difficult to us. And uh, I put some uh, lessons for Brazil, pay, uh, think about in the present and the future. I think lesson one is the solidarity. The, the current crisis demands intergenerational and uh, interdisciplinary solidarity for everyone. And I think the lesson two is recognize the problems, is the, is the big problem now. So uh, it's vital that we recognize the existence of these problems and understand that deficiency in gerontological knowledge make them worse. Um, and the lesson three, protect older people and protect everyone. The absolute priority is protection of the population as a whole and particular old adults. Um, and the lesson four is strengthening the primary health care. You can have urgent and strengthening of primary health care policies. Uh, in lesson five, create of remote monitoring strategy. Uh, you, you can see that is absurd, but uh, telemedicine and telemonitoring were not approved in, in public and private assistance in Brazil before the pandemic. And uh, the regulation say just for the pandemic, not for the whole time. So uh, social distance made Brazil advance in the provision of distance care. It's very good for the, the health. Uh, telemedicine, telemonitoring, telecare, uh, now it can be used for the, the whole, uh, yeah, it, it can use but the different uh, areas for the, the knowledge. Uh, lesson four, I think it's guaranteeing for survival and protective equipment. Uh, the infrastructure is, is ne very necessary. And the uh, lesson eight is offering a concrete guidance and support for long-term care. Uh, policies to combat the pandemic must consider the evidence accumulated by those who study aging in order to develop guidelines aimed to the needs of institutionalized people and the most vulnerable, but to use the, this knowledge. So, and um, I think about the lesson nine, the support and care for homeless older adults. We face a, a very big problem now. And lesson 10, support caregivers, familiar and professional. And I think every <laughs> lesson is, uh, is related about that and support with protective equipment and uh, anything uh, we have to support. And support for older adults who care for other older people or who still depend on casual labor for the the livelihood and assurance palliative care. We need uh, the assurance of a human humanitarian approach in palliative care when necessary. Uh, we, we need a policy about that. So uh, we have some lessons of the pandemic to Brazil. Uh, at first, the, the COVID-19 surprised everyone and will change the world permanently and combat ageism and tackling violence against older people needs to be on the agenda of the Brazilians, government and society as a whole. And social policies must be robust, long term and aligned with the speed of age of Brazilian population. And the recognize the demands of the older person can mobilize society and to make social changes and solidarity networks were developed during the crisis and people is helping uh, each one. So we you have to invest in, in that fact. Social distance made Brazil advancing in, provide, in provision of distance care, telemedicine, teleorientation, telecare, and the demand, uh, the demand for communication uh, through technology has made the older people developing more basic, basic digital skills. So you have to provide digital inclusion, inclusion policies and uh, permit the access in the internet and uh, in the low cost about the use of the equipment and uh, the internet. Um, care physical activity and leisure service and religious service expand the 
offers at a distance and positively increase the, the reach. So you have to explore you know, this, this fact and they try to use for, for a long time. Um, to conclude, dealing with the COVID-19 crisis for more than 10 months, we learned a lot. We have a red discovery weakness, but we know about that in the past. And it's up to us to get strength to mobilize society and policy makes for change. Now we are entering in the second wave. So I think we have to, to do it better. I think, um, yes, uh, I just prepared some slides to start this conversation. And I have to say, muito obrigado, muito obrigada. Thank you for all. Thank you for everyone. Obrigado, George. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Um, and I think what is what is striking, certainly for me, um, is how similar um, the yes. Brazilian, not just experience, but I think also the issues that have been raised by Carla um, and then the lessons to be learned. Uh, what is striking is how similar they are, certainly to the UK. And I'm sure uh, talking with colleagues as we have been doing over the last eight or nine months around the world, the situation does seem to be very similar in yes. most around the world. So, so thank you for that. I, I, it was a really interesting uh, walk through, uh, and thank you for sticking to the to the time. Um, can I just say that uh, we are going to have questions together at the end, but if you do want to post a question in the chat to Carla, then um, please do that because Carla will monitor the chat and see if there are any questions that, um, that we can pick up after that. But um, for the time being, I'd like to um, once again thank Carla and then move on to our second speaker, uh, another another dear friend and colleague of the Institute here in Oxford uh, and someone whom we have known for many years. Um, and this is Professor Johannes Doll uh, from the Federal University of the Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, and he is about, I believe, to become the president of the Brazilian uh, Gerotechnology, Gerotechnology Society. Um, and Johannes is going to share with us uh, the challenges, learning challenges uh, in Brazil for older populations and how maybe we can use education to enlighten um, older people and empower them. So Johannes, I will hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisen. Uh, I, I thank you very much for the Institute to invite me to speak uh, in this part. I, good afternoon for everybody. <clears throat> I think uh, Carla has given uh, a very specific uh, situation, a uh, report from the moment in Brazil. Now I will try to give a little broader uh, view, but maybe it's interesting uh, to say where I'm speaking from. So actually, uh, I'm not Brazilian, I'm German, but I'm living more than 30 years in Brazil. So it's, I think this can help to understand that I'm from the School of Education. So I will give a more uh, gerontological and a more educational view of Brazil. So let's start the presentation. Okay, well, um, it's something I was speaking, I come from outside, so something which was very uh, interesting for me to see that things in Brazil are working very fast. Things are going faster than we normally see in other countries. And I brought here the name of uh, Joseline Kupczyk, 50 years in five. This 
accelerated way of development of going on may be a very specific uh, thing of Brazil as a whole. So I just want to point out uh, three parts. Uh, it's the aging process in Brazil, it's the economic changes and the digital revolution in Brazil. They're all things we are seeing uh, on almost every country in the world. But what in Brazil is interesting to see that this development is uh, quite fast. So these uh, rapid changes, we see there are specially cha uh, challenges for the older person because uh, things who move very fast are sometimes difficult for elder people to understand and to deal with. So I will have a look on this part. First, the aging process, uh, Carla has set up a little. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the aging process is starting in, in Europe, so in the 18th, 19th century. In Brazil, we have almost a year when it started, it started in 1960, so it's not so far away, 60 years. Uh, at that moment in Brazil, we have a very young population, more than six children per women. We have a, a low life expectancy of 51 years. And most of the population are a young population. So there's a very small group. And comparing with Latin America, we can see that Brazil is even a little younger than the rest of, the rest of Latin America. But then it starts. Uh, we have a very fast decrease of the infant mortality. So we can see it was very high in 1960 yet, and it goes down now to uh, about uh, 76, uh, 15 uh, per mil, uh, so it's a quite low level. We saw that the fertility rate also decreases very fast. We have now 1.7. And of course, by this, the life expectancy is growing up. So in the 60 years, the life expectancy of Brazil, they're growing almost uh, 30 years. And now we have, as Scala said, uh, more than 30 million uh, older people. Older people in Brazil means 60 plus uh, because we are a developing country. So the, uh, the cut when you are start to be old starts with 60. But by this, we can't forget that aging in Brazil is quite different. It's may maybe the most heterogeneous group we have we can see all part of kind of people, professions, colors, activities. And this is important, important to, to get clear when you think about Brazil. Brazil is always one thing and always at the same time the contrary of this thing. Uh, what we have in general is quite low schooling. So if you say the older population, 28% have none or less than one year. And there's about the same number who has only four years. So we can say it's more than 50% of the elder population who has who are functional illiterate. Uh, there's only a small group of less than 20% who have more than nine years. The average is by 4.6. The financial situation is interesting uh, because uh, Normally for the elderly in Latin America, the situation is quite bad. There's only a small group who has a little more income, who has income in Brazil. It was actually the 1988 constitution who helped a lot for the elderly. For me, it's one of the strongest points where they had done something for the other people, some politics. Um, so they get the pensions and the social help uh, it was marked by low. It has to be uh, at least one minimum stage. And this was a quite important thing because before it was very low, the, uh, the pensions, and by this there were a minimum. So today we have a mostly low but steady income uh, for the elder population. On the other side, we have very fast economic changes. Uh, in Brazil, uh, we had uh, a very strong, very protective politics in the 70s, 80s, and in the 90s, it was a very uh, quick opening of the economy, which brought a lot of problems. Uh, 
but something I want uh, to look here is the inflation, because inflation was a very customized thing. When I arrived in Brazil in 89, we had inflation about uh, close to 3,000% in the year. At that time, I was working at a school and I owned millions each month, but uh, no worth. Me. It's interesting that in Brazil with the real plan, it was possible to stop the inflation. And since 97, we have inflation is about 3 to 7% yearly. So it's a quite stable economy. And another point, which at the moment is getting a problem for the elderly people, uh, in the 90s, it was almost impossible to get some loan. The banks didn't give any loan. They actually, the banks uh, made their money about, especially with the inflation. And when stopped the inflation, the banks had to look at other ways to get money. So they started with uh, credits, give loan to the people. And today we have a very strong offer for loans. The banks want to do people uh, to, to loan money uh, because we have very high interest rates. So just to give you an idea, at the moment, if with a credit card credit, I have to pay about 300 to 500% interest rate per year. This by an inflation rate from 3 to 7%. Um, in 2005, 2004, so they implemented a new form of loans, especially for the elderly people and especially for the pension receiver. So it was called a credit consignado and the pledged pension, it means you get a loan, you have to pay back. It goes directly from the pension to the banks and the interest rates are lower than the normal interest rates because the banks have absolutely no risk on this part. Uh, by this, the banks started a very strong publicity for elderly people to doing this loan. And today we can say that more than a third, almost half of all pension receivers has done at least one of these loans. The problem is that most of the elderly people didn't are customized to deal with loans. So they get surprised when the, uh, the income, their pension get lower and it was possible to compromise until 35% of the income. So it started uh, very often to get financial problems when they started to get this low. Uh, so for a lot of elderly people, it was the first step in over indebtedness because when they are almost paid, uh, the loan, the bank arrives, say, oh, you can get more money and they go again and they go in a circle which most of them didn't come out. So this left uh, to exploration of the older consumer, especially by banks and especially by intermediaries who are doing this, uh, this convincing the elderly uh, by mostly at the limit or in evil ways, which are prohibited to the banks. So they get the intermediaries to make this uh, work. And of course, it's also possible uh, that family members started to exploit the elderly. If you say, well, for me, it's very hard to get some a loan, but uh, my father, he can get uh, this federal loan and he pays a lot less uh, interest rate. So I, maybe he can do it for me. And we have seen that almost 30% of all credits are made by the elder people are for other, not are for them themselves. Well, this was the second part of changes, uh, which comes very fast. And the third one is, I will point out the digital revolution uh, in Brazil. Well, uh, um, this revolution is in all over the world, I know. But in Brazil, it's the same at the aging process. It starts later, but it goes very fast. So it's only 1972, the first computer built in Brazil was put in operation. It was at the University of Sao Paulo. But now, 2020, almost half of the Brazilian households has at least one computer at home. It's even stronger if we are looking at the internet. 1990, it was introduced in Brazil, but only restricted to universities and companies. 
And in 2020, almost 80% of Brazilian households access internet. And even stronger is with the cell phone. It arrived only in 1990, the first cell phone in Brazil. And now 30 years later, almost all households in Brazil has at least one cell phone. So these very quick changes to arrive uh, may be especially complicated for elderly people because they are living in a world and the world are changing fast that they can accompany. And so it gives sometimes the feeling to be a stranger at his own home. And uh, maybe this could be seen by, by this part of Hamlet when he said to be or not to be, that's the question whether it's noble in the mind to suffer the stings and rows of a judge's fortune, not changing, or to take arms against the sea of troubles. So elderly people are in the situation, I get customized to my situation, which is not good, which made me suffer, or I have to go on, have to learn, have to deal with all these innovations we have seen. And this reminds me uh, strongly to um, Peter Jarvis, to the uh, educational uh, theory of him, when he is speaking about uh, learning of older adults, uh, that is, he called it this junction. He said that life usually happens unconsciously, taken for granted. We are doing the things we are doing every time, but not, not thinking a lot about that. But learning begins when we leave the comfort zone, when the world we see are not uh, in the same way we want to react with them. So it starts by coincidence, by divergence, by separation, distinction, and it got to this junction when things, the perception of the reality are quite different from, for what I customized to do. So at this moment where we have to this junction, they are starting this interesting question of to learn or not to learn, to stay or to go. So learning begins with experiences for which people do not yet have a ready answer. The disjunction leads to the question change or stay. I can stay. It. Uh, it's an interesting part. We can not learn. And a lot of elderly people decide not to learn in some parts. So there is no change, no learning. And normally it's a kind of exclusion of the world which is going on. Or I have to learn, I am searching for solutions, learning, integrating new experience in my biography, but learning is always risky. Abandoning something known for something unknown might be uh, quite incommon for the elderly people. So at the moment I see in Brazil four big changes, uh, challenges. The first is I have to apologize, I forgot to translate. Let's see. No, well, so I will have to speak in English. Well, the first is to learn uh, to live in a world which is marked by changing and by technology. The second part is learn in a world, learning to live in a world which is marked by consume and by financial exploration. The third one is marked learn to live in a process with his own aging and the changes this aging is doing with me, with my body, with my ambience. And the fourth is try to learn to live. And this kind of learning process reminds me a lot of Paulo Freire because these learning processes are not only input of information. Uh, we, we have seen it by the courses for digital inclusion. Uh, how can I take a picture and send it to my grandchildren? It's not only to give an answer to that, because it's complex and just put on a point. Or how can I get access to my bank account by cell phone? It's not only the technical information question, but it's important to understand what is going on. Understanding to get the process and the wider context. And this is where education comes in. And by this uh, uh, famous phrase of Paulo Freire, I think we can see it when he said, um, first in Portuguese, no basta mecanica mensche, 
é para um, ver o UFA, é necessário compreender qual é a posição que ela ocupa no seu contexto social, quem trabalha para produzir uvas e quem lucra com esse trabalho. It's not enough to read mechanically Eva saw the grape. It's necessary to understand which position Eva occupies in her social context, who works to produce the grape and who profits from his work. So you have to understand these changes in a wider context, especially in this consumer part, to avoid exploitation of the elder. But where does this adult learning happen? It happens mostly in daily life, by trade and error, by the social context, by mass media, by general information people are getting. But there are other places which are interesting, institutional education. This in Brazil, we call it Asia, it's youth and adult education. We have third age universities who are working with this part. The health costs, all problems they have, it's a very important thing to maintain the, the health education in Brazil. We have senior groups, but we have also other forms where we have C2C as learn process. This might be the service by the public defender. So if elderly people have a problem, a legal problem, they can go there. And this is a learning process because there is a disruption and you have to learn to deal with the new situation. So the public defenders, people who attend them, they are in this part kind of educators. They're not always uh, uh, conscious of that, but they are. And the same part is in Procon, it's a consumer protection agency which help a little people to deal within this world. Well, and I will uh, finishing my speech about this aging world, this changing world, it's joy or it's suffering. Uh, it's both and I will give you an answer. Uh, the Brazilian music maybe helps, it's a little more positive, but it regards the problems too. So, uh, It's from uh, a key from this father and son. It's uh, uh, Gonzaga, Gonzaga and Gonzaginha. And the music actually is from the Gonzaginha. And uh, I give you the uh, uh, English version. I stay with the beauty of the children's response. It's life, it's beautiful, and it's beautiful. To live, not to be ashamed, to be happy, sing and sing and sing. The beauty of being in eternal parenthesis. My God, I know the life should be much better, and it will be, but it doesn't stop me from repeating it's beautiful. So we have to take seriously to learn and to maintain this beauty of being an eternal apprentice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, thank you for reminding us how important learning is, and particularly lifelong learning that is becoming a, 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 a well-worn phrase, really, but there needs to be some, some substance to it as well. And I particularly like your ending, the beauty of being an eternal apprentice. apprentice. It sounds like one of those prize-winning books from Latin America as well. Um, I, I don't know. Thank you. For, so thank you, Johannes. I, I, I wonder, do Carla and Johan, do you have any comments to one another's presentations or shall we open up now to um, uh, a general discussion? Shall we do that? For my yeah. part, you can do. Yeah. Yes, you can. So I, 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 noticed, uh, I noticed from the chat uh, that there were two questions um, one in particular to you, Carla, and then maybe a more general one, but I think to you as well, Carla, about how much is the problem a general gerontology aging issue and to what is the problem of general economic inequality, specifically when it comes to poverty in African origin ethnic and poor rural groups. And then the second question is, um, what would be the best way? I think this actually could apply to both you and to Johannes. Yes, yes. Best way for the digital inclusion of older people. So, Carla, do you want to respond? Maybe. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, uh, the main challenge we face is inequality. Inequality expressed the access to full life. 
work education, health, leisure, and uh, all the dimensions of life. And uh, uh, this has been going for a long time. So having the, at the moment the face wageism, violence against women and the elderly, racism and uh, and the lack of policies to reduce inequalities in a government uh, that does not come into the contact the problems uh, of the population and the deny science has been extremely harmful to, to control the crisis at the moment. I think the big problem is inequalities. So, and the lack of policies is the very big problem now. now. Uh, and uh, it's it's changing, uh, it's, 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 it's very bad now. Uh, I, I think uh, we discussed about that in the last seminar in the LARNA and Alejandro and uh, other colleagues can do, can talk about that. But uh, we face the, uh, a sadly moment now. Yeah, uh, the hope is very, is going. Uh, I think we have to to find the the force the to the resilience to to facing uh, the moment, not the crisis, but the moment who Brazil is is facing now. And uh, I think uh, 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 Johannes and the other colleagues can can. Uh, can hope uh, in this in this discussion, but I think the problem is inequalities, yes, and the lack of the politics mm -hmm. to reduce it. Johannes, how do you feel about that? I mean, because I think inequality does it screams at you from both presentations. Actually, doesn't it? Yes, I think there were different movements we had in the uh, 2005, 2010. We had a movement where things are getting a little less inequality. So uh, there were a great group who was very poor and they're coming up and they're going a little better. Né? And there was some some sign of, of hope in this part. Né? And actually in the last two, three years, uh, the sign of hope disappeared. Né? So actually we are going back to a, a, a world of quite separation of, of more people who are very poor and very a little group which is quite rich so this this question about this equality is one of the basic of Brazil I think it's, it's quite historical uh, we can't deny we come from a, a slavery society né? and on some kind we maintain I just this isolation of a small group who are the properties and the rest of them are the workers and uh, not any more slaves but the, the, the this classification remains very strong in Brazil. So it's it's a hard work and I think we are doing, we're trying to, to work to get things a little better now. Yes. Okay, we, um, I noticed also that uh, Professor Harper has um, posted a question um, on the chat. Um, do the speakers think that the concept of intersectionality, particularly that laws, institutions and programs built around it do not fully account for people who find themselves at the intersection, has even more relevance in the COVID and post -COVID. Yes. Carla, you'd like to you'd like to respond to that, I see. No. <laughs> I <disagree>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Um, well. I have to understand it better. Uh, Johannes, if you want to talk <laughs> or let me understand exactly. Yes, uh, I think for me it's also this uh, concept of intersection. It's not so clear for me. Maybe you can help a little to understand this concept of intersectionality. Yeah. Sarah, are you there? Can you expand on that? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Shall I? Um, so, can, could you put your question and explain what you actually mean by the concept of intersection? Yes. 
So, so in gerontology, we've, we've worked with this idea of intersectionality for some time now, and, and it's the idea that a person's lived experience uh, is very much framed by their multiple um, identities. Um, so in other words, there is some kind of co-occurrence of the framing of them as people, which is both their gender, their sexuality, their ethnicity, their age, etc um, and that their lived experience cannot really be disentangled into those separate components the problem that we have is that um, institutions tend to build around these single variables rather than understanding that people are defined by many different variables and it seems to me that one of the problems with covid is that we have very much privilege the concept of age uh, and particularly many of the programs seem to use a chronological distinction and that age per se whether it's over 40 50 60 70 80 etc yes, has uh, been the sort of dominant thesis see uh, yes uh, okay now i understand and i, I can assign i agree totally we have in brazil you know the separation from 60 years, yeah. so you get older when you get 16. Eh? And uh, in, in Europe, it's 65. And the question is, in Brazil, we are finding now that it's very problematic because if you go to definition 60 years, you are a group of the elderly, it don't fit. It fit for some people, but don't fit for a lot of other people. Eh? So this kind of separation by, by laws, and legal separation, are kind of problematic. I, I agree totally. Man. And uh, I think we are uh, uh, discussing at the moment, I think there is not, uh, it's not totally dissolving. In the gerontology, we are speaking a little about if 60 years is really a good, uh, uh, good way to define other people, or if we have to look at other uh, uh, at variables, other characteristics now. But it's, it's at the moment, it's not very strong, this discussion. It's, it's more a feeling that some things don't fit at the moment. And, and we, have a, we have a couple of interesting comments, if I may just pick them up. One is on generational justice. And one of the participants is asking what younger people can contribute and what older people can contribute to achieve generational justice during this pandemic. Um, and do you have any ideas around that, either of you or both of you? This was a very interesting point even before, uh, because there is, there is a discussion, if there's conflict about the younger generation, the elder generation. Um, I think in Brazil, we had uh, normally a kind of uh, integration uh, but we have seen in the last years, the last decades, that the problem was more for the younger generation to get work, to get some, to come into the, uh, the world to, to make his life. Uh, but on the other side, we had the other generation, which normally I help. So we had uh, younger people are living longer with their parents. Uh, we have data that uh, the families where we have older people in, they are financially better than the families who have not elderly people, which shows a kind of solidarity between the generations. Yes. And so I think at the moment, it's mostly this part. It's interesting because the other uh, generation, by this yet security from the constitution to have at least one uh, minimum wage, uh, they have some money. It might be not a lot, but they have some money and the younger population sometimes have no money. So there are some helping between the generations now, at this moment. So at the moment, of course, this opens also the way to explore. And we have these cases to violence, financial violence, from youngers who are exploring the elderly. Uh, this, this happens too, but in the great part, I think at the moment, the elderly generation is more helping the younger generation to survive in this quite complicated moment. Yeah. For the other hand, uh, we we can 
can have a young generation uh, help like, as a proxy of older people in use of technology, for example, and uh, it can can construct a good uh, uh, relation about that because uh, older people in general uh, think, oh, uh, younger people uh, lose your time using technologies and uh, and and, and thing. Uh, I think we have to construct this relation in a continuum and uh, help people recognize the importance of different uh, parts of life né? and the uh, and the people. I think we have to to balance the yeah the contribution of different actors. I have I have seen uh, this very interesting question about uh, the yes. generational <laughs> justice. Yeah? Um, I think this is a very good point. Uh, I had at the moment the impression, well, actually in Brazil, I think the solidarity might be normally not so strong as in other countries. There's a solidarity within the family. There's some solidarity within the group. But besides that, everybody sees to survive himself or herself. So um, this, the idea of a general justice uh, might be present in some specific groups, but it might not be the general idea of the younger population. I think there is, uh, uh, at the moment, I see some groups which are coming back to try now. We have to take care. We have to have a, another view, but it's, it's, it's a, I think, I think it's a small group. Uh, it's yet the, the surviving of everybody uh, is at the moment uh, more important for most of the people. I don't know if you, what you think, Carla. No? Yes, yes, I agree with you. Uh... So, and, and, and maybe, maybe, intergenerational solidarity is also a victim of, of, of the inequality that seems to be um, quite widespread and, 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 and quite significant. And therefore there is more, uh, or rather there is a, a lack of solidarity with anyone, not just across the generation, but even within yes. the generation. It's a very, it's a very selfish mentality driving forward. If I may, Carla, just pick up on <laughs> you mentioned that um, younger people uh, can actually help older people accessing the internet and computers, etc. And earlier on, there was a question around digital inclusion of older people. And, and mm -hmm. you both see the younger generations as a conduit, as a, as, a, as a way that older people can become digitally included with help from younger people in their family, maybe? Yes, I think so. I think so is the, the main, yeah, it's, um, it's very important because of the connection, the right? different uh, uh, ages and uh, it, I think is the path. But uh, I think the digital inclusion first to recognize that our older have had a low exposure to digital technologies and uh, it's necessary to expand the contact and uh, um, it's necessary uh, study about uh, how the elderly people use and learn uh, and uh, uh, use technology and learn and, uh, and that value how can they recognize the the value uh, and have regard they use technology to make the life easy so uh, I think the younger, uh, the youngest is important to to help and uh, make the life easier for them. Uh, uh, being a, a proxy and uh, solve some problems. Now, um, I think we, we have to to have uh, programs, good programs, and finance this program for reducing inequalities in the terms of the access of the internet and the equipment is a very big problem in Brazil. Um, internet access is very expensive. So uh, we have a grand part of the north and northeast with a connection just in the squares and the 
public connection, not in, in the homes. Uh, I think uh, the support, the digital literacy and provide quality internet is uh, at the lower cost is important and the large co corporation need financing programs and support community programs. I think the university have uh, had important uh, role in these uh, in these issues. And uh, uh, Johannes study about the uh, use of technology in digital inclusion of older adults and uh, he can talk with us. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna have to, I'm gonna have to come in there because my, my, my technical overlord has, has, uh, has messaged me saying we have to finish by five past three, which is in one minute. So um, I, I would encourage you all to continue what yes. very interesting conversation and there are more uh, points in the in the chat as well that can be followed up on and I would encourage you all to do that and engage with one another um, but here as we're about probably to be cut off I don't know um, but let me thank again Johannes and Carla thank you so much thank you. for finding the time sharing your experiences from Brazil with us. I think it's been a very enlightening and enriching uh, seminar. And I do really thank you both very much and for being such good. Thank you. The Institute. And thank you everyone for, for, for joining us. And finally, I hope I can get this in. The, the Institute has two seminars that I, I, I need to mention next week in our final week of term. At this uh, two o'clock on Thursday next week, we are looking at South, uh, Africa uh, and the seminar by our colleague Jaco Hoffman, Aging in the Youngest Region of the World, which I'm sure will be equally interesting for all of us. But also on Monday, November the 30th at 11 a.m., Professor Harper is speaking um, to the topic Achieving Healthy Life Expectancy for All. And there is more information about both of these seminars on our website. Um, so do please check them and sign in. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as possible again next week. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much.